Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today as we remain operational, operational as an organization remotely. The pandemic has forced the Wilson Center to remain socially distant, but it has given us more opportunities to connect not just with analysts and practitioners in the Washington area, but worldwide. So a special welcome to those of you um, who are logging in from outside of the United States. Of course, the Wilson Center is a US-based think tank. It is a living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, who is the 28th US president, and to this day remains the only American president with a PhD. Uh, we are focused on international affairs. And since the escalation of tensions between the United States and China, we have devoted considerable attention to the shifting dynamics in Asia, the changes in regional order and great power competition. Our focus today though is very much on the perspective of Southeast Asia's elites and their outlook on US foreign policy amid growing tensions in the Indo-Pacific region. What is very interesting um, about today's presentation is that we will be approaching these issues not simply from a security or economic angle, but much more from a sociological perspective. Starting today's discussion is Nobuhiro Aizawa. Nobu has been at the center since last September as the Wilson Center Asia Program's Japan Scholar, uh, which is an initiative supported by the Sasaka Peace Foundation. He is on sabbatical as an associate professor of Kyushu University's Department of Cultural Studies. Uh, joining him is Irene Wu, who is a former fellow with the Wilson Center. She is also a adjunct professor at Georgetown University and a contributor to a forthcoming book entitled Cultural Values in the Political Economy. Uh, before we begin, let me point out that we are welcoming questions from you um, at any time during the session. If you could simply email us at asia at wilsoncenter.org or tweet us at Asia Program. Again, that's Asia Program at WilsonCenter.org for email, uh, Twitter at Asia Program. That would be great. So with that, Nobu. Ah, sorry about that. Sorry. Well, uh, thank you very much again uh, for Shioko-san for the kind introduction as she um, introduced myself. Uh, I'm currently the Japan Scholar for the Wilson Center. Um, which I really thank Shihoko-san and the director Abe Denmark for welcoming me here in DC. And also thank you so much for this uh, fellowship has been a, uh, possible due to Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Tokyo support. So uh, that's my biggest segment for my uh, research to happen here. Um, let me uh, share my uh, research here today, which I focus on the Southeast Asian elites. So um, I have been a scholar in Japan uh, who has been working on Southeast Asian politics, Southeast Asia-Japan relationship, Southeast Asia-China relationship. But um, the, the, miss, uh, the missing link for me was Southeast Asia and United States. Uh, this is because when I have been studying the history of Southeast Asia, I cannot neglect the fact that the Southeast Asian post-World War II history has been very much in, in relate to Japan, Southeast Asia, United, United States Triangle. Um, and looking on the recent studies, there are many resources that suggest that the role of the United States is receding. For example, the 1998 economic crisis made United States uh, um, reliability lower in addition to the 2008 economic crisis as well. Partner with Japan also has shifted because Japan, Japanese economic has stagnated. Uh, the economic power once it had is not anymore there, while China is on the rise. And as you can see from the series of pollings that has been done through the Southeast Asian elites, expecting China more role or leadership compared to the American leadership or even the Japanese. But as I have been researching in Southeast Asia, it is also very clear to note that all the leaders and elites are very much in, related to the United States, especially in their educational background. So there is a very 
interesting puzzle here. When all these elites, when they are reviewed, they talk about more on the receding leadership of the United States. But if we look up on their background, they're more a nurtured by the United States. And if I mo look more carefully, there are even more clear picture, especially in the financial technocrats and the financial elites, that they're heavily on their mindset with the United States uh, education system. So how has this impacted the, the network and the power dynamics and the policy making is the basic puzzle that I'm trying to get at. So let me start looking at the data. Uh, this is uh, kindly compiled by Irene, who is uh, with us today, um, that how much students are, are coming from Southeast Southeast. And if you look at the data, what's, which is highlighted in red, the students from Southeast Asia, especially data is from Indonesia to United States, has been increased in three, four, fifth hold. So from 1960s to the 1970s, when the Cold War were at, at its peak, the Washington consensus was the way to go with an elite. Those times, the students were less than thousand gradually growing and especially even after the economic crisis the Indonesian students in the United States has increased there was a little dim in the 2010s but now it's increasing again of course uh, there is a vicissitude between in the very higher post 6,000 numbers but still it's a very high number this is all the same to Thailand as well uh, Thailand has been increased Thailand is one of the oldest allies of the United States um, there is an increase but recently um, after the 2014, uh, there has been a decrease, but still the level is pretty high, especially compared to other countries. Um, so that really cements the kind of a steady position of the United States in understanding the, the role of human development of Southeast Asian elites. This is in contrast to the kind of IMED trend. IMED is the uh, International Military Education Training Program. Um, this is the percentage, it's not an actual number, it's percentage of how much budget has been allocated to Southeast Asia compared to the global spending of the IMED. And there is a gradual uh, decrease on the military education training side. So um, you know, this was the one that we were been talking about, how American presence is being receding, but overall the kind of uh, the educational system that United States has been champion is pretty strong in the United uh, in Southeast Asia. This is very obvious. Also, if you look at the elite of the elite, which is the cabinet ministers, um, the red shows the ratio of the U.S. graduate cabinet ministers. Um, so you can see well, uh, there is a back and forth between like 25% to 47%, but United States is undoubtedly the biggest share uh, of foreign trained cabinet ministers. Um, I show you a, a little bit of a, a bigger picture where Australia's are catching up, come to the elite of the elite, very much the US has dominated the position. And this is to compare from the 90s to the current Prayut period. So, you know, despite of the economic crisis, it's very, it's very stable. And also, uh, despite whether it is a democratic government or a military junta, it also, you know, uh, is there, the American trained cabinet ministers is there. And we could argue a little bit that even for a undemocratic um, cabinets, as even larger pie of the American train, which I see from the Jawalit, Suryut, and Puyut, all these three military uh, cabinets. This is also, in a way, same with the Indonesian cabinet too, uh, especially in the post-economic uh, crisis. It didn't go through all, but it's a very same trend. The American share is pretty stable, uh, 30% plus, and, there will be a plus and minus with other countries, but it's the dominance of the U.S. train is very much there. I think this is a remarkable 
and an understudied and under acknowledged fact that the U.S. has nurtured and U.S. has an asset in make the American policy in Asia forward. But of course, things are not as simple. So I will be doing the research. I have been doing the research in Washington, D.C. about how would this affect the overall politics in Southeast Asia and the policy of the United States. So my question that I have been tackling is this two thing. How has the rising number of international students to the United States impacted the Southeast Asian politics per se? And also, what is the strategic implication of this social trend for the U.S. foreign policy? So um, I will go through it very simply the benefits that this has been leaked and also the challenges that it has created. So talk about the benefits, I think especially for the Southeast Asian politics. Uh, I have to do a disclaimer that I, I on this note, I, I have a very heavy emphasis on Indonesia. So please forgive me. Uh, Ten countries in Southeast Asia, there are a large difference in pictures. But uh, for the time, for the benefit of the time, I'll let me focus on the Indonesia, which is the largest country in Southeast Asia. And so with that disclaimer, uh, let me go forward. Uh, so the benefits I can simply point out is first, it's the smooth elite circulation has been able to made. As the, the famous, the Pareto's elite circulation said, the dynamics in the elite, how could that be managed is very much direct to political stability. So Indonesia went through from an authoritarian regime to democratic regime. Many suggest the oligarchic system is still there, but also if you take a closer look, there is a circulation. And if that circulation between the old elites and new elites should have been rough, the political stability is logically going to be not to not exist. But I think this Anglophone society or the Anglophone community that the American system has um, nurtured really helped to create a kind of a platform that the old elites and the new elites can coexist despite that several old, old elites have lost their powers and shares, especially due to the economic crisis, the two-time economic crisis really damaged several old elites. And there were several new elites, new sector, new elites coming up due to a lot of transformation, economically, technologically, but they do coexist. And so the process of the democratic system in South, uh, and especially in Asia, lead to a large-scale instability. As everybody noticed, everybody was talking about the balkanization of Indonesia. Of course, uh, a lot of credit should go to a very wide design of their decentralization uh, governance system. But I would argue also this structure of elites, you know, the old elites and the new elites, share the same language that the Anglophone world has created, also give a very good chance for them to, to kind of share the same um, benefits and cushion the kind of um, the threat perception that the change of generation, change of political regime could create. Let's give you an example of this. So everybody was talking about the last election. Uh, there was this Jokowi versus Prabowo. This was the second or third matchup. And of, of course, Prabowo, who was the ex general from the Suharto period, the Kostrad army commander, uh, he, he has all the baggage what the old elites have. Well, Jokowi has more of a representative new elites, which does not um, rooted from the old elite structure of politics. They have been fighting. Um, they have, there were so much wars that if the loser could not accept the defeat, the country could fall apart. And that has been there for a number of times, but Indonesia haven't fallen into that trap. And surprisingly, uh, they could share hands after a, such a very hard, um, talk that they have during the campaign period. One of the very interesting is if you look one layer down of the top elites, there are people who are supporting those top elites being a very good friend of each other. 
So in this picture on the very right is a person called Sandy Agauno, who is the running mate of Provobo. And center, the, the two sent men, who is Eric Tohir, who is the current um, minister of, um, uh, what was it, I'm sorry, um, minister of state-owned enterprises. And the center left is Rosan Roslanis, who is a chief of Chamber of Commerce of uh, Indonesia. So actually, this group of people were rivals in terms of leadership, but actually friend behind the scene. And they are very good friends because they have been co-setting up new private equity funds. If you look at a lot of shared ownership in a lot of uh, energy companies, media companies, and also recently in tech companies. So this network of, uh, crosses over the old structure of uh, Indonesian economic structure to the new one. Um, they will be following the leaders of a, the different political bag, but the network that has been created underneath those political leaders, it's a very widespread and it's a very strong network. And what I could argue here, the very um, characteristic characteristics that they have in common is they're all U.S. educated. So like Eric Toy here that I just um, gave you the example, he is, he is a, one of the new elite that is rising. I think he's one of the most powerful cabinet ministers right now in Jokowi cabinet. And, and he has been a, one of the, one of the um, generation that has been groomed in the United States. Uh, it's not like the financial technocrats that are from the Barclay Mafia that were told in, told in 1970s, or he is not fr from the military training. He is a self-funded uh, um, graduate in the United States and then being an entrepreneur back in, in Indonesia. And he once owned the DC United, which is the, uh, DC's football team. So he has a very... Uh, well connection in the DC, even though his education didn't. So um, he is definitely a person to keep an attention on. And he has been in the midst of all this network, which was being told in a very famous um, a film that was published uh, last year in 2019. It's called The Sexy Killers. Uh, this was a, a very investigative journalism talking about coal, structure, coal mining structure in um, in Indonesia, the tone of the movie was very much to kind of um, uh, condemn the kind of the elite structure that is shared between the Prabowo camp and the Jokowi camp. But I will look at it differently. This kind of network really kind of cemented the elite network to circulate smoothly. So there's the, all the old elites and the new elites in this map that could not, that doesn't have to go um, to a over rivalry. Um, the political rivalry could be maintained within a certain scope that doesn't have to go to, for example, a, a restructuring of a national order, but it could remain, the, the game of the politics could be remained because of this kind of structure cemented the elite circulation to go smoothly. So back to the points, the benefit, um, the, the kind of Anglophone network um, really cemented the, you know, they, they, re, they prevented the demonizing the others. You know, you don't have to be the Javanese demonizing the American nurtured. You know, it's, it doesn't have to be, you know, um, condemning all the Americans as anti-nationals. That doesn't happen. Um, of course, there are elites from the um, Islamic group. Um, there's our, our the elites that are nurtured in the Middle East institutions religiously, but they also didn't have to demonize to, the, to a, an extent that was anticipated. So all these kind of things happening, the shared background of the American nurture system among the widespread elites really cemented the, cir the circulation. Uh, that's the first point. The second benefit, I would argue, is it did strengthen the intra-ASEAN talks or the communication or the business beyond borders. Southeast Asia is a region with different languages. It's not like the Latin America or the Central Asia or Africa it, that has a, a lingua franca 
at the outset of their national process. The Southeast Asian country all had a national language that is strongly tied with the political legitimacy. So when we come to a point that ASEAN has a you know, economic led um, uh, interaction, it's very difficult. It, it has to have a kind of a new shared platform for the political elites to follow through. And if you look, go to the ASEAN meetings and everything, the talk is all in English. So that really cemented the kind of overarching, like share and try to harmonize certain structure of policy making. And you know, it's much easier for them to communicate rather than not sharing the language. And that language being the English, which is which has a long history, not just because of the post-war American power, but from the British power that were be structured in the colonial era, uh, that's, that has been a huge benefit, especially for the American policies too. Um, think about if this was a Japanese language, lingua franca situation, once Japan had tried to do, or it was, it was a Chinese language, which even had a very strong possibility of having in the early 19th century, it, was, it would have been very different. But um, thanks to this long history, um, having an English, not French, not, uh, not uh, the uh, Holland or not the other languages, but the English being the lingua franca really benefited the United States for this arena too. Um, the third one, will be the overseas Chinese. While the US-China relationship has been, the US-China competition has been, uh, it's even more uh, strengthening and sharpened. Um, there are a lot of talks about how overseas Chinese could tip the, tip the balance toward the China's side. But I will argue that would not happen. Since the 1970s and 80s up until now, uh, you could see this overseas Chinese, especially the business elites, has much more exposure to the American system or the Anglophone elite system. Um, the way that they have reached out in their business, even though their grandfather generation had no contact with the American system, um, it's, it's a very different world right now. The overseas Chinese interact in English with the other overseas Chinese from a neighboring country, so Indonesian overseas Chinese elites will talk to the Thai overseas Chinese elite in English, not in Chinese, or to the Philippines. And that really opens up the region. So it's not a Sinophone. It's, it's not a, you know, a, a national language. But the overseas Chinese is actually the bridging people that through the Anglophone world. So considering the overseas Chinese because of their Chinese nature, being a friend of China is a very huge mistake for a strategic thinking. I would argue they are the people who kind of is in the intersection of all these national structure. Also, there is a contact with the Sinophone structure because of their family background, I, th that's no doubt, but also they are like the bridging factor of with the Anglophone world. So, um, from the American point of view, they will be the kind of de facto allies if they could be cultivated right. Um, and also from the Chinese point of view, if the Chinese wanted to advance their influence toward Southeast Asia, it's not the Chinese language that they have to master, it's the English that they have to communicate. The Chinese elites will communicate with the Southeast Asian Chinese elite, not in Chinese, but also more so in English. Um, of course, this structure might will be changed due to the Hong Kong situation right now, but at the, at, the situ, at the current situation, this role of overseas Chinese being more Anglophone has a very strong strategic impact. So they, it, it's very wrong to misunderstood the overseas Chinese as a one arm of the Sinocentric world of Asia. The fourth benefit that I would argue is that the intellectual hegemony of United States has been saved and strengthened due to this uh, spread of this Anglophone elites in Southeast Asia. Um, if we talk about how the 1997, 1998 economic crisis or the 2008 economic crisis 
has been a severe experience in how much they distrusted the U.S. policymaker. You could go on and on. But even though the U.S. or more precisely the D.C. was discredited, there was a very strong trust toward, for example, to the Wall Street or to the Silicon Valley, to the broader American. So as a, as a U.S. in the broader sense, not centered in D.C., I think the network really benefit to balance out the discredit that the DC has made, not leading to the overall US discredit. So this is an intangible benefit that is very hard to measure, but I would argue that the benefit is pretty much priceless. If you could look at the other countries, you know, uh, like for example, the current Chinese foreign policy, when they do a damage, there is no cushion that lead from the Beijing uh, damage to the Chinese damage. But here, this network will cushion the DC damage, to, not leading to the US damage. I think that is a very strong benefit that I need to point out here. Um, and also, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot to share this. Uh, the, um, I'm talking primarily about Indonesia, but also um, I could see this from the foreign direct investment structure too. So where there is a more of an Anglophone elite domination, like in Singapore and Malaysia, you will see the foreign direct investment ratio is more diversified. So this, 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 um, this graph is not to, um, to emphasize how much uh, US investment is big or large, but it's more about, I would like to ask you to uh, understand how big the others are. So the others are very large in Singapore and Malaysia. And this structure of more of an Anglophone elite dominance will open up the country's diversification structure. So as, you, as everybody knows, Southeast Asian policy, or especially the foreign policy, is to diversify. And that diversification is so far working with the country that has a lot of Anglophone elites in their structure. So um, if you compare with Singapore, Malaysia to Laos, I think that will be a very clear uh, structure here. And if the Southeast Asian country wants, uh, has an intention to continue diversification of incoming FDI to their countries, I would argue that the Anglophone structure is a plus, not a minus for the respective country to pursue. Now, uh, the challenges. So it's not all rosy. Um, I, I argued that this Anglophone elite is a huge asset, as I argued, but it also comes with the challenges. Because as you might know, uh, as I talked in the initial part, um, despite of the dominance of the US trained elites, all the countries are not necessarily US friendly, especially they are not expecting the elite leadership, uh, the US leadership in the long future. Um, that's the puzzle and I'm trying to get at that uh, with several points. First is what the Markovits has argued about the meritocracy trap. Um, well, the smooth elite circulation did stabilizes, stabilize the political dynamic, but actually it is a worrisome trend because it's dividing the elite to the middle class and whether the management of this division really is the heart of how the political stability in Southeast Asia will hold um, because of the rising economic disparity really matters how much the demo especially the democratic countries can maintain their democratic consensus building process a credible and trustable one. Um, one of the studies, um, the very famous elephant curve has been updated. And if we look at this uh, updated curve, it is more increasingly clear that it's the top elite that is taking the, the total, uh, a large part of the total growth and the bottom having a, a relative growth too. Um, if you think about Southeast Asian countries in the middle income to a lower, it's currently still okay because if you look at the 20%, 30%, 40% uh, per percentile, percentile zone, that's where the Southeast Asia middle class are and they are growing. So those middle class in Southeast Asia middle income countries and the elites in those countries are both growing. 
So they share the benefit of growth. So they share the current direction. But while the country grow further and the middle class moves into the 40% and 50% or the 60% percentile, they will feel more of the squeeze compared to the elites. That's where the difference between the middle class and the elites going to politically happen and severe, just as it happening in the United States or even in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan as well. So it is a worrisome trend. And that is where I would argue that the American-led elite system or the meritocracy, meritocracy system has to be managed very wisely. Otherwise, it's going to backfire for a American policy purposes. Um, how it's backfire? It will, it, will, it will be easy to understand. The, the democracy could be the enemy for the public as it, it is a cover for uh, securing or cementing the elites in the respective country, which is partly a, what's happening in the Philippines too. Philippines have a very strong uh, sense of injustice between the, uh, the middle class and the elites. And you will pick up a democratic elite elected anti-US uh, leaders. Uh, and be why? Because the American connection is considered as a very divisive, elite-centered structure. So that is the a kind of a big worry that the United States will have to face. The also another pattern will be like Thailand, when the middle class feels very much worrisome due to their economic structure because of their uh, the growth is stagnant. Um, they will feel the more popular vote as a threat to their positioning. So when the United States are demanding democracy, those elites who elites and even the middle class who are nurtured with the United States will feel that the United States is creating a fear to, against us. So they will actually ratify the coup on contrary to what the U.S. has been expected. So the 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 kind of the meritocracy focused structure of the United States connection with the Southeast Asia very much is currently um, prioritizing capitalism against democracy. And with that, without a good management of this uh, balance between the capitalism and democracy, um, even though at the face value, the US nurtured elites look like a good platform for US foreign policy, it could backfire. That will be the kind of challenge that I would see. And this will also lead to the second point. Um, the United States also with Japan and other countries too, uh, because of the, the deepening of the more a business or a elite type of connection, the geopolitical strategy or the geoeconomic strategy will not be able to champion over the kind of business bankability interest decision-making. So, um, it's not going to be always like the geopolitical security issues that defines the political or especially the foreign policy outcome, uh, rather than the bankability or the economic rationale. Uh, just to give you an example of, for example, the 5G deals. So 5G deals uh, throughout Southeast Asia, it's more likely that the, um, with the exception of Vietnam, it's more likely that the Huawei will have a share in every country. The recent deal with the uh, Indonesian telecom company, it's called a, 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 uh, uh, with the uh, combination with the Urdu, which is come from the Middle East, uh, they will decide the, uh, the 5G setup with the Huawei company. And this decision, this major decision is being done by all these American nurtured capital entrepreneurs with their global outreach throughout the world and throughout the region. And there, with their um, capability and knowledge, they will create a, a very bankable and very feasible um, set of deals, uh, which is very good in terms of market logic, but could be a hindrance for a geopolitical interest. So, um, you know, they, they are very close to the American capital, 
but they may not be close to the DC foreign policy making. So the, the priority is different. So when I emphasize this, that the Southeast Asian elite has a very strong platform with American friendly, but it doesn't necessarily mean that for American foreign policy will be harmonized with Southeast Asian policy. I think this is the kind of um, the logic that is happening, which is a major challenge. So um, let me just briefly move on to the policy recommendation. Uh, my first policy recommendation is definitely uh, because of the uh, worries of inequality that leading to political instability and then to anti-American narrative, I would focus on the Asian middle class. Uh, I think the Asian middle class has to see the American structure or the Anglophone platform as their growth model while as the, the elephant curve is showing that their, their positioning is not rosy. Um, the elites will have always an opportunity coming to the United States and worry, but where the policy intervention or the policy support need is more on the middle class. And especially not just only the business side, but I think the legal side and the technological field um, is very important especially how these technological advancement transformation could lead to a more democratic, human rights friendly situation. That is a big question mark in Southeast Asia, and that could only be done with the support of the United States. Um, I think that is the very important part and how not to isolate these American nurtured elites in their country. I think this is good not only for the middle class, but also for the Southeast Asian elites for their position. And so, um, you know, what United States can do is very much on uh, immigration policy. Of course, the, the COVID-19 has changed the equation and the condition of how immigration policy will be um, defined. But uh, immigration policy, not just for the um, university enrollment, but also employment opportunities, how they are tied will be very important especially because if I do a research on the financial sector, um, their financial sector employment has been the kind of node of this network, like the, uh, the Goldman Sachs and the Citibank and all these uh, financial sector has nurtured the elites in post graduation, but now it's increasingly, it's the tech engineers that are being nurtured and becoming the node. And these, will, these people will become the top elite that, that uh, in the 10 year or 15 years. You know, people like uh, Nadi Makarim in Indonesia has already become the minister level, but it, this trend will definitely increase and especially due to the American global company em um, employment trends. I think that has a huge impact and I think that has to be coordinated with a lot of university entrance policy and immigration policy. And what has to be done is not just about the meritocracy you know, the business model, but also the democratic value, just as the IMET uh, program and the military training has done in the 70s, 80s, will also be becoming increasingly important, especially in the rise of tension between China and the United States. And, and, and that the easy thing that uh, the United States could do is especially to resume the US ASEAN summit on human capital. So this was a summit that didn't take place because of the COVID-19 in last March. But I, I understand the focus of the agenda was the human capital, which is very, very correct. And I think I, I, I cannot applaud more than those who designed the meeting for this. And there is a, a it's a very important acknowledgement. It's a political acknowledgement because it has been done. The United States policy has been done, but the political acknowledgement is not there. So having a political acknowledgement of what United States has been done is very important. And I think the human capital development emphasis uh, in, in the coming uh, decade is very important. And, and the, there is all the facts there, like the YC, YC Alley, um program uh, started with the Obama administration and also leads to the Trump administration. This is one of the program that has been consistent over two administration and even growing one. And this has winning the hearts of the middle class um, uh, Southeast Asian generation. Uh, 
which also leads to a lot of social circulation, uh, social mobility as well. So this is a very well thought, but not politically acknowledged enough. And I would, this is a very easy task to do. So I would recommend the, uh, the acknowledgement to come through. And third, um, the human capital is not human capital development is as is not easy as uh, uh, everybody might think, and it doesn't have to be done only by the United States because the Anglophone network has been spread throughout Asia, not just in South Asia as so one country, but also with Japan, Korea, Taiwan, even in China too. I think that platform could be emphasized by working this human development project within the alliance system and also spread around democracies too. So this is more, this, it's, it's not a, a kind of a standard alliance, alliance system management, but more uh, focusing on human development, not only for the military uh, training, but also for all the financial and tech, uh, tech, elite, uh, tech capabilities to create a democratic milieu in Asia will be a very uh, promising uh, way forward. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Great, Norbert. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive, um, thought-provoking presentation. Um, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to hold off asking questions and ask Irene uh, for her comments. Norbert's already used some of your um, data. So over to you, Irene. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shahoko, uh, for inviting me to be on this program. It's great to have a chance to hear so much more about um, Nobu's uh, research. Um, let's see. Uh, what I'm going to do is just take a few minutes to talk about my research on soft power, which I think puts uh, Professor Aizawa's work in um, a, a, a different context. And then I'll turn back to his presentation and just make a few comments. For the last couple of years, I've been working on this project to measure soft power, which is a country's um, uh, uh, ability to persuade others to its point of view through attraction um, rather than coercion. And the way I uh, developed uh, a rubric to measure cultural influence, which seems like an almost impossible thing to quantify, is to think about what people do when they're interested in a foreign country. What are the activities that they might undertake? The simplest thing would be to watch a movie. Um, and a bigger thing would be to go visit that country. Uh, a bigger commitment would be to study uh, abroad in that country. And of course, the ultimate investment would be to actually emigrate to that country. Um, and data on all these kinds of social interactions is available for about 200 countries. And I have data from 1960 to the present. So let's look at the data for Southeast Asia. Um, I'm going to walk through this network diagram in two ways. This is um, a data for the ASEAN member countries, 10 countries in Southeast Asia in 2017. The two ways I'm gonna walk through this diagram is first through the type of social interaction. So you see that um, here on the right, um, we have immigrants from ASEAN abroad, students going abroad and visitors going abroad. And then the second way I'm gonna read this network diagram is by the country destination. So let's start with the immigrants and you see here the blue arrows indicate the top five destinations for um, ASEAN nationals who emigrate abroad in 2017. By and far, um, the most um, uh, uh, important destination is the United States. There are 21,000 uh, uh, ASEAN immigrants in the United States. Um, the second uh, most popular destination is Saudi Arabia. And then you have um, Australia, uh, UAE, and uh, uh, Canada there, the five blue arrows. If we look at students, so these are students who in, uh, go abroad and enroll in a foreign university for a degree. So these are very committed students. The top five destinations for ASEAN students. The first uh, most popular destination is mm -hmm. Australia, yes? Uh, the first most popular destination is Australia, and the second is the United States. Um, the UK is, um, 
and China are, are about in the can same level. The slide? I can see the slide. Can you see the slide? Yeah. Let me see here. There we go. Irene, you didn't share it. There we there go. There we go. Oh, okay, there we go. All right. So this is the slide. All right. So the blue arrows are the emigration. Um, the U.S. is the, the major destination. The red arrows are the students. Australia and the U.S. are the largest destinations. And then the green arrows are visitors. And China is by far the most popular uh, destination for ASEAN visitors, as well as Japan, and then several other um, regions that speak Chinese, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau. So this just gives you a map, a snapshot in 2017 of um, where ASEAN people like to go when they go abroad. Now, a second way of looking at this network diagram is to look at it by country destination. So if we're talking about uh, China, China uh, is a popular destination for visitors and also for students. Um, uh, the United States is a popular destination for immigrants and students, but not so much for visitors. And then you can see that both, uh, that Australia has both immigrants and students, but far more students than immigrants. So this just gives you a sense for three of the um, four elements of the soft power rubric um, where ASEAN stands today. Now, the last element, watching movies, is here. Um, not as many countries report their movie data as <laughs> report the uh, immigration and student uh, and visitor data. This is um, the top 10 movies uh, in 2017 in Malaysia, Singapore, and Laos. And um, this is uh, top 10 movies in terms of uh, uh, tickets sold um, or box office revenue. And here we have the uh, countries that produced those movies. And overwhelmingly, um, the most popular movies in these three countries for that year are produced by American companies. Um, the degree to which they're produced by other uh, countries, they're in co-productions with the United States. You can see on the right um, the four titles of the co-productions that involved other countries. Now, Laos is an exception in this set. And in Laos, there were four Thai movies in 2017 that made the top 10. So this gives you a flavor for what the movie situation is like in Southeast Asia. So um, uh, let's see. That disappeared. I still had something else to share. Okay. All right. So um, this is uh, some references if you want more information. Um, now turning back to Nobu's presentation, there were uh, a couple of thoughts that came to mind. Um, first of all, um, the uh, critique of the American meritocracy as really separating the elite from other parts of society. I think that's a very uh, valid criticism of the American meritocracy today. Um, certainly as it's reproduced by um, um, elite universities. However, it is a little bit ironic because the term meritocracy would suggest that you're pulling talent from all of society um, into this uh, a university system or other kind of um, elite production systems. And so this critique suggests that the meritocracy is actually no longer a meritocracy. And that's something that's of um, significant uh, domestic debate here in the United States um, and, you know, elsewhere in other countries, how much are just uh, alumni um, uh, uh, sending their, their children to these universities and the pool of students is not as broad as it might have once been. Uh, so that's one comment on, on that argument. Um, the second, I was very interested in the elephant curve and your, your comment, Nobu, that, you know, as, as, uh, uh, Southeast Asian uh, middle class cohorts move up the income uh, uh, percentile that they might feel um, that they share less in, in the gains uh, in uh, of economic development. Um, and that's an interesting statement. I think it might, there might be underlying reasons 
that would determine whether they would feel that squeeze more or less. I think in, the, in, in terms of the US economy, um, there is that sense that uh, uh, the middle class and uh, working classes don't benefit from some of the economic growth in the United States, um, part for many reasons. I think one of the major reasons is, is technological change. Um, there's a lot of blame placed on international trade, but in fact, I think there's been a lot of structural change in the economy and that jobs that were once um, required people to work are actually being replaced now by, by technology. And you, know, you see that when you go into retail shops and you don't need a checkout person to buy a product anymore. You can just use the computer, or if you want to order at a restaurant, you could just use a computer and all those service people are not as required um, as much as they used to be. I had an experience, um, speaking of 5G, I had an experience a couple of years ago where I was at a tech demonstration in Washington, DC, and I was able to use a joystick to manipulate a bulldozer in Texas. Um, so that means these kinds of construction skills, skills and jobs that we used to think had to be done in person, um, won't necessarily have to be done in person any longer. And so that's gonna be a huge shifts in the economy. I think the pressures of this virus pandemic probably will accelerate some of that because I was socially distancing operating that mobile, uh, that, uh, that, that bulldozer just a few years ago. So um, we, that, might be, that might be one factor uh, to think about. Um, finally, um, third point, your, um, your conclusion that really, um, you know, uh, a country's influence, in this case, the Anglophone influence in Southeast Asia is not centered on the state and the government, but rather on civil society, I think is very much what I hear in the soft power literature, that, you know, a country's influence is very complex. It's, and uh, um, it's more powerful when it's not just coming out of the state and coming out of the government, but when there are society to side society relationships. And I think that's a real strength of the discussions at the Wilson Center is that, you know, we kind of look beyond the traditional policy making tools and think more broadly about social um, context and social networks. Thank you so much, Irene. Um, that, that is really great. Um, unless Nobu wants to um, intervene and, and um, address some of the issues that Irene raised, um, I, I want to give you that opportunity if, if you would like to respond to some of the comments before. Can you unmute and unmute? Yep, just, just, a, just one addition, as, as Irene has um, suggested, I think the technological shift is, is going to be a big factor, as you mentioned. And currently, it, uh, the technological uh, gains that Southeast Asia is trying to reap is now more so in, in, at the expense of the growth of the lower strata of economy. And you know, it's kind of a locking down the lower middle into the lower middle rather than um, you know, enhancing the lower middle to the upper. So by, by you know, all these kind of new uh, working contracts. So you, you see that, you see that in like the Gojek structure. So that's why you know, all these uh, like the Uber type of uh, you know, service model, the service gains, but the labor does not gain is going to expand. And while these uh, tech companies are on the rise and on the rise to the elite circle, they will champion the policy decision-making and that policy priority will leave the, the lower middle class unless it's addressed in a very systematic way. Um, so that's the kind of worry that I also have. So thank you for pointing out. I, I actually have a question. Um, I found it very interesting um, that you pointed out that the United States is not taking full advantage of this asset of having this Anglo uh, sphere, Anglo trained elite to work in its favor and promote its own um, interests. Um, but at the same time, I was actually really intrigued by the fact that you said that China's not going into that space that just because there is this vacuum, there is no other competition to fill that kind of leadership void. And I see this, um, is, I want to ask whether there is a comparison between what's happening in the United States and the middle 
uh, classes and below. There's a tremendous anti-globalization movement. Yeah. There's yeah. a great deal of economic nationalist movement. Yeah. And that kind of economic nationalist insular moving sentiment is seen not just in industrialized countries, but also in emerging markets, including Southeast Asia. So instead of saying, you know, from Washington's perspective, we say, okay, are you going to choose Washington or are you going to cho choose Beijing? It's not that. It really yeah. is much more about, you know, more hunkering down, internalization. Mm -hmm. Is is this what I'm hearing from you? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, so it's as as everybody now focuses on like um, investment in understanding like the US China competition in Southeast Asia. Um, it's there's more of that employment side and like how much will the U how much will the US signifies a more employment opportunities is is pretty much the key. And especially uh, not just in terms of, you know, benefiting the, the top elite capital gains, but more so on the lower um, gains in the, um, the economy. And how much will that lead uh, that um, they are in the same national development? Like, is it the elites are doing its own with the global capitalism and the, the lower, you know, uh, strata is doing their own struggle if it is if that too is in a different narrative there will be a political clash but if they're in the same narrative i think that will have a better chance to to develop together well china did not do well enough because of course the chinese emphasis on the elites are pretty much even stronger than the American model too. And actually, unfortunately, um, why I said Americans are not taking the full advantage is because unfortunately, there is also an increasing emphasis on only on the elites while disregarding the risk that is coming ahead. Um, currently, it's not surfacing as much because of the lower strata or the middle class, lower middle class is still growing but you know as the elephant or the flattening elephant curve and then it could be a snake model uh, if that comes through um, i think the united states will go into the same mistake that uh, china did and and that what i mean by not taking the full advantage so yes um shoko-san you're, you're right in pointing out that point All right, so um, I'm afraid we've really come to the end of our time. And it, unless um, I'm going to ask Irene if you have final words um, on your end, um, final words on your end, Nobu, um, we're going to have to draw this discussion to a close. Are we good? Thank you. Thank you. It's been All great. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Yes, um, please. Call, I'm sorry that I, I spent some time. Uh, please contact me with my to my uh, email if anybody has a question. I'm very happy to answer through emails and everything else. So yes. Great. All right. Well, uh, thank you both for um, really leading this discussion. Of course, this is an ongoing topic, so we hope that we can continue this dialogue. Uh, for those of you who were able to join us, thank you so much. Again, this will be available online on the Wilson Center's website, as well as on YouTube, and I hope you will be able to uh, join us on other occasions as well. So goodbye from us for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.